um, this panel um, to discuss my colleague's book. I have to um, say that I finished reading the book over the summer, and uh, about five minutes after I finished reading it, I sent an email to Walter, like, great book, let's do a panel. And, um, and I feel like that um, often uh, works are not celebrated in one's hometown. And I thought um, this book um, and Walter's contributions to multiple conversations really deserves um, this kind of conversation. So um, I'm Shelley Rambo, I'm Walter's colleague, um, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this um, very distinguished panel uh, to discuss uh, the ground is shifted. So um, <coughs> how we're gonna move through is um, I'll do introductions all at one time and they'll go in the order of the introductions. Um, each of them will speak for, I said, no more than 10 minutes and Walter will then respond. And I hope that we have some time left for um, some Q&A and maybe discussion uh, between the panelists. Okay. Um, oh, also I want to, I don't want to let this go. Um, this is hot off the press. Um, the fourth volume of the papers of Howard Washington Thurman, The Soundless Passion of a Single Mind, um, writings between June 1949 and December 1962. So, surely editing like this must take as much effort and work as writing one's own. Right? Yeah. How do you weigh? Um, is Teddy Hickman Maynard. Um, he is Assistant Professor of Black Church Studies here at BU School of Theology. His teaching and research focuses on ecclesiology and evangelism. And his dissertation, I'm imagining book in progress, is titled Joyful Noise. And I'm not gonna read the very, very long title. So instead, uh, this Joyful Noise explores the significance of gospel choirs and how they function within institutions of higher education. How's that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's better than mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's an ordained minister in the African Methodist, Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and his pre presentation to the School of Theolo Theology faculty a little over a year ago, um, many of you remember he engaged Dr. Fluker's work, which I was very sad, that was recently published, but you were on sabbatical, so you didn't get to hear it. So I'm hoping, <laughs> that, I'm hoping that portions of that will make it in um, to the discussion tonight. Um, it, it, obvious, it made him an obvious choice for this panel, um, but a serious interlocutor of, on his own right in black church studies and black religious life. Um, our second speaker is our own Heaven Hong, um, who is a doctoral student in the Constructive Theology and Ethics program. Uh, her work on constructing ethics within the post-colonial context of Korea draws on the figure of the orphan, um, and while still in its percolation phase, it promises to be a stunning contribution to the field of ethics. It has a tentative working title. The Orphan Subject and the Art of Self-Emptying, a Theological Ethical Proposal. Mm -hmm. um, Heaven is a deep and incisive thinker and feeler, and Heaven is a beloved teaching fellow and an incredible colleague. Mm -hmm. uh, our next speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, our next speaker is Pamela Lightsey. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dean Lightsey is associate dean here and soon to be Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs at Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago. Yes. Uh, she's a scholar, social justice activist, and military veteran, and really a forerunner in queer theology as evidenced in her, um, her book, Our Lives Matter, A Woman's Queer Theology. She has urged this community and the wider Christian community to embody our prophetic calling, not merely in word, but in embodied actions of resistance in times such as these. She's a very valued um, member of our community and we're sad to see her go. Um, Jonathan Walton is plumber professor of Christian morals and Pusey minister in the Memorial Church 
and professor of religion and society um, at Harvard Divinity School. His right. research addresses the intersections of religion, politics, and media culture. His first book, Watch This, The Ethics and Aesthetics of, blank, of Black Televangelism, contributes to the study of American religion by examining the relationship between the media and Christian theologies, particularly used by white conservative evangelicals. We're really thrilled that Dr. Walton crossed the river for us. Thank you so much, Shelley, for organizing this uh, incredible panel. And of course, thank you to Dr. Fluker for writing the book that has brought us all here tonight. Um, I'm, for those who were at uh, my job talk, this will be a little boring. I'm going to reprise some of that material uh, just to share with you um, how I enter into conversation with Dr. Fluker's book, um, uh, at least in regard to the work I'm doing now. So. Um, I did a comparative ethnography of, of three historically black collegiate gospel choirs um, in the Boston area, predominantly white universities. Uh, the research highlights the ways in which these groups utilize worship practices of the black church in America as resources for the cultivation of black communal racial identity and solidarity, while at the same time embracing uh, folks into the membership of those uh, communities that is increasingly diverse from, uh, from a standpoint of their racial identification as well as their uh, religious affiliation. And I, I started to interpret this data uh, through the lens of Dr. Fluker's recent proposal in his book about the reformation of black ecclesiology in response to a postmodern politics of difference that dominates much of black theological reflection. So just to summarize, uh, Fluker advances the reclamation of black racial identity as an existential home that avoids the essentializing postures of ontological blackness on the one hand and the equally dangerous narrative of post-racialism on the other. Fluker proposes that the first move that black churches must make towards the rebuilding of the foundations of black communal identity is the practice of remembering, a concept that he borrows from Toni Morrison, which signifies not only the act of recollection, but also the reappropriation of the complex and sometimes contradictory discourses of black experience for the purposes of contemporary meaning making. So remembering then, is the stitching back together of disparate personal stories within the frameworks of the larger historical narratives of black experience as a way of reclaiming a notion of black identity that is neither naive nor nostalgic, but yet is deeply rooted in a collective hope and an abiding communal self-love that grounds the black Christian tradition. Um, so I argue that um, the work that I've done among uh, black collegiate gospel choirs um, serves as a practical um, example of this ecclesiological hope that Fluker holds out. Uh, Martha Frederick uh, talks about the black church as an example of an alternative public sphere, a public sphere within which the cares and concerns of black people are privileged in contrast to the dominant white social sphere of American society in which black lives are devalued at, and dismissed at best, and at worst, threatened and taken. My argument is that these historically black collegiate gospel choirs, they emerged in the 60s and 70s as black students sought to recapture some of the empowerment that they felt within the black public spheres of their uh, background in black churches, and they wanted to enjoy some of that experience and transpose that experience into the hostile environment of the predominantly white universities uh, to which they had now been gaining greater access in the wake of the political gains of the civil rights movement. Um, Cheryl Sanders, Reverend Dr. Cheryl Sanders, who, who offers us one of the only uh, other research projects on these choirs, 
She talks about the irony that these choirs at the time, because of their focus on worship and performance, they were initially denigrated by more radically and politically oriented black students because they felt that their evangelical emphasis was insufficient as a form of resistance to white racism. But she says that it is now evident that these gospel choirs represent one of the most vital and ongoing institutional expressions of the student rebellions of the 1960s. And so these choirs continue to function in that respect. However, because the population that takes root in the choirs now are no longer predominantly black or exclusively black, there's a question about what it means to be a black community when there is so many uh, so many, when there are so many different understandings of what blackness is within the communal space, and there are people in the communal space who aren't black. So what these choirs do is they practice a, a form of narrative discipline. And what that means is that they do not discipline the way people behave, they do not discipline the way people perform, but they do discipline the narrative that will be at the center of the community's identity. So black stories of resistance and struggle are at the center of what we do together. How you interpret those stories, how you make sense of yourself in relationship to those stories is not something that we can prescribe, but we will discipline ourselves to be informed around the centralizing of these narratives and the recalling of these narratives as diverse as they are and making them the center of our life together. So, how does this uh, relate to Dr. Fluker's work? It does so because I believe that Dr. Fluker's work um, describes what these choirs are doing in a way that responds to some nagging, um, uh, a, a nagging issue that I have within black theology that is best expressed by the work of Victor Anderson in Beyond Ontological Blackness, where he articulates that the essentialist constructions of blackness that were used as a foundation for theorizing communal identity and solidarity are insufficient for black theology and dangerous for two reasons. First, ontological constructions of blackness are reactionary, requiring whiteness and racial oppression as a starting point, and thus privileging whiteness by placing it at the center of black identity. And therefore, Anderson postulates that black theology does not contribute to individual thriving or flourishing as long as it is limited to a theology of survival or liberation, because its narrow conception of black life is too restrictive of black freedom and therefore concedes black identity to white supremacist renderings. Second, ontological constructions of black identity rely on restrictive prescriptions of black cultural experience as a uniform set of cultural expressions that are deemed authentic whether it be language, music, fashion, or other norms of behavior. In contrast, Anderson proposes a postmodern politics of difference that seeks to decenter all externally imposed categories of identity in order to give full voice to the multidimensional individual. But in this new work, The Ground Has Shifted, Walter Fluker challenges this postmodern politics of difference. Fluker affirms the, the central critique that essentializing constructions of race can function in oppressive ways that stifle human flourishing, but he is also dubious of the ways in which this discourse is too easily co-opted by the narrative of post-racialism. Fluker casts post-racialism as a ghostly figure that haunts America. When viewed through the apparition of post-racialism, the deleterious impacts of racism continue unabated as consideration of race as a legitimate and meaningful category of identity and social analysis recedes under a cloud of naive multiculturalism that assumes the language and posture of racial progress while ignoring the persistence of inequality and injustice based on race. Fluger argues that post-racialism haunts black churches as well calling into question the ground of their communal identity as the shared bonds of racial solidarity that formed the foundation of the development of an independent black Christian tradition can no longer be assumed. So as an antidote, <coughs> Fluker urges black churches and those who theologize their meaning to embrace the practice of remembering. He's careful to note that memory and metaphor without critical engagement and historical suspicion are dangerous and destructive. But so like Anderson, Fluker is wary 
of an uncritical hermeneutics of narrative return that devolves into nostalgia. Instead, Fluker adopts Toni Morrison's robust literary notion of rememory, which addresses the analytical relation of habitus, memory, and history in the quest for human identity. Remembering race is not a mimicking of the past that reinscribes essentialist notions of ontological blackness. Rather, remembering refers to the way we must utilize memories of our past as points of departure and sites of excavation as first steps, not the whole story, but first steps, in reviving a prophetic black religious discourse and practices within our struggle against the ghost of post-racialism. This act of reclaiming particular narratives of black experience and reconceiving of blackness as a viable and meaningful category of communal and individual identity is at the heart of the communal practices of the groups that I study. And so I contend that their practice of remembering race on the shared ground of their gospel music experience can provide guidance for the black church in the future. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that there's only one way to narrate blackness or even black Christianity. Um, but I am arguing that this form of narrative discipline where we center ourselves around this remembering, this act of remembering, is a way of privileging blackness while at the same time creating space for others to be a part of that conversation. And I will, I'll end there and uh, let others talk. Thank you. inviting me to be part of it. It is my honor and also I'm super intimidated by <laughs> to see with this greatest uh, prominent panelist here. I really enjoyed the entire book, but today I am going to start stick with stick to one concept that struck me the most, which is <coughs> commitment. Dr. Fluker discusses the shape shifting ghost of post racialism in America and offers a vision of good life as one of the practices to remedy. The concept of commitment takes a key part in this discussion of good life. Here, I will use this question to transpose those concepts to the context of Korea and will discuss my interest in freedom, which I think is inherently tied to the concepts used in this book. I want to start from a moment of my field study in the summer 2013. I was researching the Bolivian Socialist Revolution and its impact on educational institutions in Venezuela as a part of my, my directed study with the Moore. During the eight weeks of field study, I was thinking about freedom, duty, and commitment. I was already 30 years old that year, and so far my life was quite too free so that nothing deterred me having a full two months of travel. My 30 years of living was packed in two large-sized suitcases. I had no commitment, no family member who needed my, in, my care, no organization I had to continuously involve myself with. One night, standing in the city, I uh, standing in the balcony of the dorm in the city of Merida, located in the center of Venezuelan Andes, Realizing how free I am, I was terrified rather than liberated. I was terrified by my ability to do whatever I want. Something was profoundly wrong that I, as a human person who is supposed to be a social being, live such a free life without any duties. Working with nuns and local volunteers in Fundacion Don Bosco, a Catholic organization that provides children with extreme poverty, shelter, and elementary school curriculum, watching their moody, calm, <coughs> purposeful, virtuous, and gracious ways of being, I was convinced that a freedom to do whatever I want is not only meaningless, but also lethal. There are ghostly narratives in post-colonial Korea that haunt our generation the shape-shifting ghost of neoliberalism. The colonial memory, and by colonial, I refer to both Japanese and US military occupation of the peninsula from the early 20th century till now. 
the colonial memory shapeshifts itself in neoliberal and neo-imperial languages of freedom, peace, and prosperity. The US military who slaughtered thousands and thousands of civilians during and after the Korean War, and who replaced and utilized the same governing structure of the Japanese Empire without helping the nation to clear out the colonial remnant, conjures itself <coughs> as the savior of the nation, the guardian and protector of the freedom, democracy, and peace. It, and I quote from the book, evades, elides, and coerces a certain mode of allegiance to itself as a transcendent good and as a sign of divine creation. By demonizing North Korea and by constantly con comparing their destitution to the miraculous and glaring growth of the economy in the South, under more than 25 years of military dictatorship supported by the US and its anti-communist propaganda, the US empire and its <coughs> collaborator conjure liberal market ideologies as the inevitable, transcendent good. The national rendering of history draws the nation, which is an abstract entity, as the sole agent of colonial history. And by doing so, it intentionally and effectively erases the destructive operations and impacts of colonial and neo-colonial occupations of the people. The local narratives of survival and resistance have been erased. So many deaths, disappearances, and other physical and mental damages are forgotten. No one remembers. The voices of the dead are unheard. In the vacuum of, in the vacuum of narratives of life and death of the generations before us, we grew up as orphans, constantly reminded how marvelous <coughs> and prosperous the West is, how they saved us, how those Western ideas of autonomy, freedom, and democracy would, and they alone could, pull us out of our humiliating and shameful colonial past. And what should we do become a nation that is comparable to the global standard? This shape-shifting ghost has plagued us years and years, debilitating our cognitive skills to imagine a good life outside of the liberal ideas of freedom and autonomy. A good life for us has been a life within the global market, a, good, a freedom to purchase, freedom to go wherever we want to go so that we can escape from the motherland which has been so humiliated. Freedom to do whatever we want so that we can become different from our defeated, erased, shameful, shameful <coughs> parents. Freedom to claim rights so that we are not going to violate it as our ancestors did. Freedom to be autonomous so that we can escape from the trap of the painful tradition. A good life can be purchased in the market. You can purchase your global citizenship. All you need is enough currency. And I lived one heck of good life that all of my friends are envious of. <laughs> but the ghost hunt, the ghost of that, ghost of that whispers in your ears, makes you shiver with fear of being a free individual. The poverty of moral imagination, the cognitive captivation in the jungle they planted in us. Where do we go from now? Dr. Fluker in this book provides intriguing proposals to reimagine the destructive narratives of neoliberalism and our understanding of freedom captivated by them. These proposals, according to him, and I quote, assume that the key to entering the infinitesimal space of black subjectivity, the realization and articulation of our agency rests within the centermost place of the will, a politicized and the fractured yearning for home, a new sense of space and time that finds its locus in a new appreciation of the body. One of his proposals for this new sense of space and time is a praiseworthy view of good life. The good life includes, and I quote, the interrelated concepts of morally anchored character, transforming acts of civility, 
and a sense of community. But when people's cognitive skills to lead such a good life have been enervated, as a young black people in U.S. cognitively captivated in cultural silence and the jungles they planted in them, and as the orphans in Korea cognitively and morally debilitated by colonial histor historiography, Dr. Fluker argues that it is a task of religious and cultural institutions to create spaces where young people can reflect on the questions of identity, otherness, and human and non-human flourishing. And this self-reflective activity is, and I quote, an invitation to find one's fluid center, that space which is profoundly spiritual, elusive, and undefined. It is also here that one comes in touch with one's spectrality, residing in the in-between space of death and life, between material and spiritual, the shadowy third where binaries no longer exist. Dr. Fluker employs this discursive and fluid assemblage of material and spiritual existence as a space where, and I quote, commitment as a tool of the spirit begins. Commitment or singleness of mind and I quote, is rooted in this fluid characteristic in life <coughs> that makes it possible to reimagine and revise one's internal environment. And he's quoting Howard Thurman here. <laughs> Dr. Fluker believes that one can rewrite, edit, and manage one's moral script by reimagining one's place in the world and how one chooses to perform, precisely because one's fluid center belongs to no territory or homeland, but points to home. home. I'm intrigued and I also want to hear more about how he connects, about how he connects the idea of commitment here. As I read, by redirecting the discussion of black leadership from the intersectionality approach, which assume, uh, intersectionality approach which ratifies the social constructions of race, gender, and sexuality by postulating an identity as a fixed and stable ontology. He moves from there to the assembly theory where identity is postulated as a fluid configuration of discursive practices and performances. And by doing so, he opens the possibility to draw one's moral scripts not from those imposed narratives of nation, or race, or gender, or sexuality, those jungles they planted in us, but from the ghostly stories of the ancestors, the dangerous memories of their death and lives. And the commitment is read as the singleness of mind to anchor one's life, to remember, retell, and relieve those dangerous memories through the vigorous self-examination and discipline of the spirit. The commitment is then the result of the discernment of one's profound connectedness to the ancestor and to those who congregate and conjure and conspire in common. The spirit then will be freed by and will free those committed new generations bound by the singleness of mind to anchor the bounded freedom, the freedom from the commitment, a politicized and fractured yearning for home of the orphans, my final direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like others, I want to thank Dr. Luker <coughs> for this book. I want to thank Dr. Sharon Fluker in her absence for supporting Dr. Fluker as he wrote this book. <laughs> thank Dr. Fluker for, for pinning uh, for, the, for the world, for everyone who will see uh, some of the language in the black community, language that should not be read and thought of as merely symbolic language. Because when Dr. Fluker talks about the ancestors, when he talks about Hanks, when he talks about 
ghosts. These things are real in black communities and they are honored in black communities. So I simply want to talk about that, bring that context and that uh, sensibility to your hearings so that we don't leave this place thinking he was only speaking symbolically. This is serious stuff That's right. that Dr. Fluker has written about. From the movie 12 Years a Slave, the protagonist, a black free man kidnapped in Washington, D.C., sold into slavery and forced to work on a Louisiana plantation proclaims, I will not fall into despair. I will survive. I will keep myself hardy until freedom is opportune. Lo these many years from the brutal conditions of slavery, Walter Earl Fluker, progeny of slaves and, most re and more recently, the black ancestors of Frog Bottom, Mississippi, <laughs> has written a masterful book that turns to memory as a resource to call our attention to those who would otherwise, to use his words, go unnoticed and unobserved by Western religious scholars and practitioners. I was moved from the first pages with the way Dr. Fluker shapes words as artistic renderings that transport the reader into the several milieus of black America, the intellectual, mystical, social, political, and yes, black church milieu. It is this last treatment to which Fluker grasps what seems like a small liner brush to play small, precise strokes to render a perspective that is often overlooked in broad brush narratives of black church context and indeed of the black community. He urges us to be freed from the haint of post-racialism and to conjure in all the ways my root-working black relatives in the Jim Crow South would understand new liberating practices. If black churches are to be efficacious in this 21st century, Fluka offers a third way of racial self-identity that does not succumb to the problems of existentialism and postmodern critiques. Here he turns to one of my favorite authors, Toni Morrison, to speak of being and becoming black or becoming aware of blackness as a fluid, he says, unfixed reality. Beautiful words to my queer ears. <laughs> he turns to these words in, and, and to speak in the search for home, which he describes as spaces where US black churches can recognize their multi-directional affiliations and interconnections with roots and shoots around the globe, but are not ultimately determined by them. Walt, I know you don't remember every word you wrote in this book. <laughs> it is in this search for home where Fluca allows us to think of black churches as being capable of global relationships as well as dynamic shape-shifting entities, able to respond to our contemporary times by remembering, retelling, and reliving their stories. Two things that I want to especially thank Dr. Fluker for, things that may seem as small matters to some, <coughs> especially important to me as one returning to his hometown, Chicago. The first has to do with his recalling and retelling the truth, the challenges of the election of President Barack Obama, especially the emotional trauma of that campaign on black communities, and to be precise, his friend, my friend, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright. Dr. Fluker situates his analysis of that time within his argument about the cultural hauntings of America. 
and what he calls the politics of dilemma. This belief, yet disbelief in justice. And as Fluker details a schizoid mode of discourse and practice between opportunism and pessimism, the revealing of contradictions in what he calls the radical egalitarian hypothesis. The dilemma is on display in our revisiting the journey to the inauguration of President Obama that the ground shifted mm -hmm. for African Americans and black churches. America showed us the great cost one suffers to be black. And to be black, not in ways that we talk about in terms of philosophy, not in terms of blackness as a social construct, but to really be black, especially black, while in public leadership capacity. Using the Greek myth of Icarus, who crashed the earth because he flew too close to the sun, Fluker makes the argument that Wright suffered from flying too close to the ground, which was to boldly claim his blackness. In 2017, with a confessed sexual abuser and racist, having been elected to the highest political office <laughs> in the land, black people ought to read Fluker's analysis, yes, as caution of the consequences of ethical leadership, but also as words beckoning us to do the work to break up the ground itself. Break it up with sacrifice and courageous work to turn around, as Fluker argues, the very theological presuppositions and value assumptions upon which many of our churches exist. Second, is a profound appreciation for the ways that Dr. Fluker centered the emergent movement for black lives without extricating the lasting contribution of black LGBTQ persons within this movement and the movements that preceded. We are now threatened <coughs> if we read uh, the report as black identity extremists. The black church cannot survive if it allows authoritarianism to pummel the success of the movement and its activists because many of us do not conform to heteronormativity. Nor can we survive if we do not revisit over and over again the historical truths of racism and discrimination that white supremacy now seeks to redefine and normalize under a false narrative labeled pure Christianity. <laughs> Finally, if I had any rumblings in my soul, Walter, it is the metaphor of black churches moving from the frying pan to the fire, brother. I appreciated fire being understood as purgative, empowering, and liberating. But I paused to ask myself whether the black church is actually in the proverbial frying pan, captured, lacking agency, and dead. I admit I would rather embrace Fluka's prognosis that the black church, as we have known, loved, and imagined it, is haunted, as he says, by an old ghost that has shape-shifted into the language of post-racialism. And salvation, then, is being open to the work and illumination of another ghost, the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Y'all scared. <laughs> Perhaps our hope then is that the Holy Ghost fire that Fluker writes of that will awaken, will resurrect what has been dead, and will kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. 
Thank you, Dr. the river. I really appreciate it. So, Dean Moore, how you doing tonight? <laughs> to all of the faculty, administrators that are here, and to all of the students, how y'all doing? <laughs> it's really good to be here. It's good to be here to celebrate the work of my dear brother, Dr. Walter Fluka. Dr. Fluka is, let me just say, first of all, like Pamela Light say, I have to, I always celebrate Walter Fluka and Sharon Watson Fluka. Yeah. Uh, some of y'all may not realize this, but Sharon Watson Fluka used to be the head of a little program called Fund for Theological Education. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And yours truly would not be standing here mm -hmm. as a scholar of religion. So I often say publicly, if it had not been for the Lord and Sharon Watson, I don't know where I would be. And, and for her support of this dear brother and my dear friend, we have so much in common. Uh, uh, Morehouse, we're both Ephesus. Uh, Chicago is his hometown, but we're both Atlanta guys. We're both up and down the road in Delta to our now hometown of Atlanta. And we both have delusions of grandeur that we're the coolest cats in the cat. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I have delusions of <laughs> and, uh, and it's always, I, I love his response. I always say, Dean Moore, I say, man, how does it feel being so cool? And Walt always say, I don't know another way. I, I, <laughs> Try to be uncool and it just doesn't work. <laughs> so I'm here tonight to celebrate the work of this cool cat. A few years ago, I was traveling through Newark International Airport. As I prepared to board the air tram, a young man approached me. He wore a red jacket and he carried a walkie-talkie in the palm of his hand. Anyone who's traveled through Newark would recognize him as one of the ubiquitous customer care representatives. More than his red jacket, however, it was his bright smile and his beautiful dreadlock crown that caught my attention. Excuse me, sir, excuse me. And with an intentionally disarming bodily posture of humility, which was probably perfected in his job at the airport, this young man said, sir, I'm sorry, but I was hoping I could ask you a question. What does your jacket mean? He pointed to my navy blue blazer, possibly the very one I'm wearing right now. <laughs> I gave him a curious and confused look. And he proceeded to ask, is that a fraternity or something? I mean, I just see some men at this airport and I've provided security for some seemingly important, important men passing through these terminals. Men who seem to have their stuff together like you. And you all seem to have on that jacket. <laughs> So I don't mean any disrespect, but I just figured that you seemed approachable enough. What's up with the blue blaze? <laughs> this story came to my mind while reading Walter Fluka's powerful and prophetic lament, The Ground Has Shifted. A 20-something-year-old working-class African-American guy in Newark, New Jersey, trying to make sense of the cultural significations of a plain navy blue blazer. He had a job. He was personable and friendly, well-spoken, 
There was nothing about him that cultural conservatives might lament as a symptomatic of quote unquote black pathology. Mm -hmm. That unfortunate concept of black a priori dehumanization and denigration. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this young man's query about a navy blue blazer encapsulates what Dr. Fluker identifies appropriately as the social dislocation and disconnection of many African Americans and other groups, especially males, mm -hmm. from some of our most basic institutions. Mm -hmm. William Julius Wilson wrote poignantly about the disappearance of viable blue collar jobs in America's post industrial economy. One wonders then, what happens to critical Marxist critiques of workers being so alienated from the tools of production that it deprives them of their life and their destiny? What happens when that ground even shifts? <coughs> Walter Fluker provides some insight. For an information and knowledge-based economy, Individuals and institutions become so far removed from the sort of intellectual productions that garner economic and cultural capital that they end up producing what Pierre Bourdieu would call their own habitus. What Walter Fluker calls an exilic existence, an outer jungle, a cultural asylum that otherizes the most vulnerable as savages outside the gate. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, and most disturbingly, too many institutions of black civil society, namely black churches, are either asleep at best or exiled themselves at worst. Mm -hmm. So in the time that I have left, I'll reference those black churches <laughs> that are asleep. Reading through the ground that shifted, I would divide sleeping black churches up by two kinds. They're the culturally inebriated, and they're the post-racially narcoleptic. Mm -hmm. But, at least for Dr. Fluker, both suffer from an acute deficiency of cultural memory. The culturally inebriated are the churches who failed to heed the admonition of James Weldon Johnson. Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee. Lack of cultural memory. And fueled by their fixation with personal uplift and achievement, prosperity comes the ground of all being. Mm -hmm. Congregational success is measured by numbers. Mm -hmm. Spiritual depth is measured by dollars. Mm -hmm. They are catalyzed by a neoliberal unholy ghost. Mm -hmm. Profit over people mm -hmm. and the personal over the collective. And unfortunately, rather than comfort, this unholy ghost haunts. Rather than assuage the ghosts of America's white supremacist past, this haunting only exacerbates the anxiety, and it fuels a memory that one has actually even denied it exists. This is why the new Mercedes no longer provides the fix. I need a Bentley. <laughs> this is why I'm no longer a chicken-eating black preacher. I'm a chief executive officer of an international corporation. Right. Mm -hmm. Look, I even have the private claim to prove it, but the more they consume, the greater the tolerance of the drugs. Mm -hmm. The greater the tolerance, the more they are conscious of America's racial ghosts that still has the potential to niggerize even their prosperously adorned bodies. Mm -hmm. The green of my dollar bill is not able to inoculate me from the black of my racial history and of the community I serve. Mm -hmm. So they're inebriated. 
But where Dr. Fluker spends most of his time is with those black churches haunted by the ghosts of post-racialism. These are the ones I'm calling the post-racially narcoleptic. This is the ghost unleashed by Barack Obama's political success. Dr. Fluker is right to point out that black communities have always entered into unstated agreements with African American politicians. We will let them court wine and dine mainstream communities as long as they shoot black folk a wink from time to time. In the words of the SOS band in 1983, <laughs> friends are always telling me you're a user. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you do to them. Just be good to me. Mm -hmm. If y'all don't know that song, y'all better go home and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the agreement that many black churches entered into with the Obama administration. As Dr. Fluker asked, citing his son's former little league coach, do you want to play or do you want to win? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is why so many leading African-American preachers avoided Reverend Jeremiah Wright, Obama's former pastor, like the play. Because they thought that they wanted to win. And they thought that if they accepted the logic of post-racialism, that indeed a rising tide would lift all boats. Thus few were willing to challenge the administration lest they feed the ghosts of white supremacy that haunted and informed his every move. And as the bodies of black young men became the voyeuristic playground of cable news 24-7 infotainment, churches dozed to the administration's lullabies. As housing recovery skipped over African American communities like a game of checkers, <coughs> and black unemployment seemed less impressed with a black president than black denominations were, churches and historically black colleges kept hitting the snooze buttons. The ground has shifted. The ground has shifted. But this book, The Ground That Shifted, serves as a much needed wake up call. It both raises the questions and provides concrete answers that might shake us all from a deep sleep. Our communities of faith, whether inebriated, culturally inebriated, or whether post-racially narcoleptic, must congregate, in Dr. Fluker's words, conspire and conjure by tapping the cultural, material, and spiritual resources that though seemingly dormant, remain filled with potential. And it's this task of congregating, conspiring, and conjuring that I'm going to allow Dr. Fluker to address with us tonight. So everyone, please, why don't y'all receive the coolest cat in the world? <laughs> Professor of Ethical Leadership, the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project, and the director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Initiative for the Development of Ethical Leadership here at BU. I could go on and on, but the most important thing is that Walter is the author of this book, which has already received, re re received rewards, we hope, but <laughs> awards um, for its contributions um, to our understanding of religion and society. It's received honorable mention um, in theology and religious studies, a prose award, which is a high, um, means you write, you write good, right? you very well, um, and was starred by Publishers Weekly. Not everyone gets a prose award. That's a pretty impressive um, thing. And I want to say that um, 
the themes of ghosts, spirits, hauntings, crossings, conjurings, um, that's right up my alley. And I'm thrilled to uh, welcome you to respond to your panelists. Thank you, uh, Professor Rambo, uh, my colleague, my friend, and one of the more exciting scholars that we have around. Let's give her. Mary Elizabeth Moore, who has been my rock in a weary land. <laughs> Very glad to see her. And all of you, and especially to this distinguished uh, panel. Man, I don't believe I wrote all that. But that's <laughs> <laughs> and I really wish Sharon had been here so she could hear this. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm going to tell her as soon as I get home, uh, Jonathan, what you said. Yeah. I promise. I promise. Let me. Uh, try to get through this real quickly so you can talk to me and talk to the panel, right? Um, you should know I was at Morehouse College for almost 13 years. And uh, I loved every last minute of it. I was working with some of the brightest uh, students anywhere in the world. Uh, and fortunately tonight, uh, well, we have Jonathan, one of those great Morehouse men. We have Andrew Kemble. But Jason came in tonight, and this is, I just want him to stand. <laughs> Jason, <laughs> Brother was just visiting Boston, and I uh, thought he'd drop by to say hello, and he saw me here. Is that kind of world. He's a political consultant in New York, and such a Morehouse man, very proud of him. Thank you. At Morehouse, I was weary. I was so weary because I was traveling everywhere. Uh, Africa, India, China, Austria, you name it. I was traveling. And I was trying to build a leadership center uh, so that young professionals going through Spelman and Morehouse and Clark would have an opportunity to stand in the world in their own space. And I was also trying to get the Howard Thurman Papers Project off the ground. Now this may seem way far away from the ground it shifted, but I'm a black Baptist preacher. I've never had a problem with that. I've always felt very much at home being black and Baptist. I'm not limited by black and Baptist, but I'm sure enough black and Baptist. And I wanted to preach so badly, and so I started preaching too while I was at Morehouse. I just did everything I could, but I could not get this book written that was on my heart. And one of the great opportunities afforded me at Boston University was to get this book done. And I still don't know today how I did it, uh, but I got it done. Uh, as I respond to your questions, they won't be seriatim, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some stories. Uh, my daddy really visits me, and I know I'm delusional, so you don't have to remind me of that. <laughs> but I very seldom uh, walk into uh, territory without a map, because my daddy is normally singing me a song. Honestly, I'll go into a space and I'll hear a song, and I'm always trying to decipher the song. Just last week, somebody was, you know, kind of chipping at the heels a little bit, and my daddy, when I woke up, he started singing, there's a leak, keep a leaking in this old building, there's a leak, keep a leaking in this old building, oh, there's a leak, keep a leaking in. And I was in the kitchen. <laughs> and he shows up. He shows up all the time. I believe in ghosts. I believe in ghosts, however you understand them, whether there's real haints in the country churchyard. Uh, the ghost helped me write this book. And the first thing I did was to remember my mother and father. You have no idea. 
My parents were sharecroppers. They didn't hate white people. They had almost kind of like Howard Thurman said, just remove white people from the magnetic field of morality. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> and they made it work. Ten children, I'm the last of ten. And they made it work. And they made it work because when the church didn't get it right, my daddy would go and see the old baby man or the conjurer or <laughs> somebody to help him kind of figure it out. Al Rabato says that, that folks who were using conjure, they did it for several reasons. One was to deal with the irrationality of race hate. Mm -hmm. Just the sheer irrationality mm -hmm. of being in a world and people hate you because you're in the world. Mm -hmm. And they also did it because they really wanted something to happen. They wanted change. And when they go and visit uh, the conjure man, you know, daddy come back home, he'd feel all right. <laughs> whatever, whatever that was. But I stayed with that theme throughout the book. And so the book is divided in memory, vision, and mission. Uh, Teddy, I think that this conversation around memory and history is one of the more vital pieces that we have, not just for African American churches. I'm thinking in terms of the ways we play with the national imaginary. People remember for certain reasons. We tend to remember what really helps us to form some sense of identity and coherence. So in this national imaginary, which I'm very concerned about, that pods is a radical egalitarian hypothesis, which never really existed, certainly not for certain people, uh, there's a kind of memory, a national memory, which has come back into the landscape. And we're seeing it. Uh, we saw it last night at another Trump rally. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this memory of when America was really great. And when uh, it was not troubled by all of the folks like you in this room who look so different. <laughs> this is important, I think, if uh, we are talking about gospel choirs or if we are talking about people who really plan on making a real difference in this nation and for me in this world. But memory is not history. They're related. So all memory, I think, has to be uh, placed to a test of serious historical suspicion. My daddy remembered Mississippi in a certain way, as I write about, but the way he remembered it was not quite the way it was. <laughs> he had blocked out so many things in the family, the lynchings, mm -hmm. the terrible atrocities, he blocked. But there was history always knocking at the door of memory, demanding entrance. In the national imaginary, we've got serious work to do as religious scholars with history. And especially the kinds of, uh, the kinds of faiths that we claim and the kinds of ghosts that haunt us, of which we are very afraid because when ghosts show up, they, they normally kind of displace things and throw things out of order. And they operate on a different sense of time. Ghosts trouble us. And in uh, American religion, American religion that folks like Donald Trump have been able to masterfully pull together Close, Ralph Reed was bragging close to 90%, he thinks, of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That's the core of his base. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with memory, which is avoiding history. Mm -hmm. I think it's important, Teddy. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to respond to that. Mm -hmm. uh, heaven, uh, <laughs> even when I read what you sent me, I cried. Mm -hmm. You are just a light. You are incredible, and I think one of the budding intellectuals, not only here at the School of Theology, but I think just all around this country and other places that I know. I am so proud of you. 
This commitment piece, this commitment piece, uh, it comes right out of Thurman. Thurman begins his work with commitment. But commitment to Thurman is about bringing all of the disordered, disparate dimensions of our lives together under, he thinks, a single purpose. For this is the way he gets to integrity. This idea that if I can choose one thing, not just Kierkegaard's one thing, but if I can choose commitment, a commitment, uh, there's something in life itself, he thinks, that will support me. Now, this works both ways. The same process that <coughs> these poets and ivy grow also makes strawberries grow. It works both ways. But this idea of commitment, and most of my work has been with this, these troubled uh, young folks in urban centers who need, who need an opportunity. They need space. And I'm thinking that churches could at least do that, provide space where there are new commitments. I would have never gotten off the south side of Chicago had it not been for the Centennial Missionary Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. And those mothers there and those choir members who just tried to sh uh, guide me and shape me home. And I write about the church, uh, but it was the church that saved me. And so this idea of creating space within, s we need sanctuaries for young black bodies. When I was in St. Louis with uh, Starsky uh, Wilson uh, at St. John's Congregational Church there, that's one of the places where the Ferguson uh, movement just gathered uh, on a regular basis. When I was with him, I was saying to Starsky, we need a space where people who are part of Black Lives Matters and all of the other new movements that are put in the can gather and really call their own name in that space. And that gathering may not look like the Christian church that many folks uh, in the communities where I serve uh, think of as church. I'm hoping that happens. And I hope it happens because most of the churches I'm concerned about are the churches that are located in these spaces of cultural asylums and where jungles get planted in the field. Jungles have already been planted. How many of you all saw the movie Get, uh, Get Out? That's what I'm calling the implant. It's, it's, it's just amazing to me uh, that not only in churches, but in communities of discourse and practice, uh, there's like a, there's a click that maybe plays a Jonathan. Man, I've seen brothers, I'm talking with them, say, hey man, what's going on? How you feel? You're looking good. And all at once, somebody else show up at the water fountain. They say, hi, George, how are you? How the hell are you, guy? It's like this implant. <laughs> Just goes off. The whole world changes. <laughs> so when Purdue is talking about habitudes, I'm talking about how this, this, we are situated in such a way that we're not in control of our bodies. So what might commitment look like in a space where people are looking for their alienated bodies mm -hmm. and able to reclaim the dignity of their bodies. Mm -hmm. One, it involves a new sense of time. One of the things that colonial powers and domination did, as Willie Jen Jennings so wonderfully uh, writes about in his book, The Christian Theological Imagination, is that it, it, it distorted our sense of time and space. And he says, we will never resolve the issue of colonized people until we begin to rethink time. And this is why I thought Derrida's ontology was just perfect for naming this ghost that elides, that evades, and shows up in all different kinds of forms. I've actually seen this ghost show up in places where people are praying and they have such difficulty uh, <coughs> confessing what they know is true in this space. Have you ever been in one of these places where folks are always talking about diversity? That wouldn't be this place, would it? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, always talking about diversity and, and you have a little prayer. 
and uh, nothing really happens. You just talk about diversity. <laughs> and it's almost like you go back to the same routine. What would happen if we had opportunity and space to rethink time, the time of the body, and of uh, the in incredibly clever conversation, I think, are ways in which we continuously avoid the grammar of the body, the, the things that the body knows. My daddy did that. My daddy had trouble in the presence of white men. It was like, it's so hard. In the presence of white men, he had trouble because for such a long time, he was told to look away. Or I've seen it in other spaces. I've seen it in hospitals. When I was a visiting pastor, pastor visitation, when black patients, often Latina, Latinx patients, would come in, their families would come, and it was just so much difficulty talking with white professionals. It was like the eyes were always here. And the folks are talking to them, but their eyes are always looking away. How do we retrain the body to be present with us? God forbid the kind of trauma that revisits us again and again in racialized memory. But it's present. And it does not escape theological discourse. Uh, I'm doing this quickly so we can get to the conversation. I think that congregating, conjuring, and conspiring, for me, looks like this. I'd like to see uh, black churches not always try to be in front of the parade. I think we, we have problems with triumphalist narratives. Right on, King Jesus, no man can. We don't always have to be in front of the parade. <laughs> and, and maybe Jesus doesn't always have to be in front of the parade, my brothers and sisters. Uh, we, we have a new world that is not coming, as uh, uh, Judith Wines had called it. It's, it's, not, it's here. It's a world where we've got to learn to have conversations with other people who, have, who worship some different gods or no gods, mm -hmm. and we've got to congregate. <coughs> and we've got to be bound together, not, it doesn't have to be a permanent <coughs> relationship, but it's more than a coalition. It has more to do with assemblage. How do we come together out of disparate parts and form a common purpose and a common work? I could name a lot of common purposes and common works that we could bring together. One would be, for instance, the kind of issues around sexual violence that we're witnessing. I think we could come together. I think around LBGTQAI communities, I think we could come together. But the issue is commitment. It's about the will. <laughs> and it's also about ways in which we've been taught to believe that we should be in charge. My final comment, and hopefully this will spur some other conversation. I was on a talk show here in Boston several years back. I forget <coughs> Charlie's last name, but it's the local PBS station. Right, right. And right, right. Cross, right? Cross it. And a young man called in, we were talking about black leadership. A young man called in, Jonathan. He said, You know, the revs done had their turn. <laughs> we deserve a turn too. The revs done had their turn. I think the revs have had their turn. Mm. I, I'm telling you, I really think the revs have had their turn. I think we need a new generation of leaders who are spiritually disciplined, intellectually astute, and morally anchored. Mm. I think we can cultivate habits and practices that will allow new leadership to move into some old spaces that have been occupied by the ghost. I'm through. Mm -hmm. The Reds had their turn. They had their turn. 
if, you know, I, I, I was at a big conference, and the last comment then, you must be. <laughs> I, I was at a conference at Harvard about five or six years ago, David Gergen, all of these folks, no, this was 10 years ago, all of these big corporate players, Starbucks, and they were talking about what the new leadership would look like. And it occurred to me, in, in one of the exchanges I had with one of the corporate executives, that whatever this new leadership looks like, Bobby, it probably won't be made in America. <laughs> Last comment. Wow. Okay. So we have about 10 minutes. So Let's go do you want to take questions from the group? I'd like any way it comes. I'll be glad to take it from the group. And the panelists, let's all join in. Let's all congregate. <clears throat> Thoughts. I, I can take thoughts as well. Don't be shy. Won't be made in America. <laughs> Where will it be made? Uh, it might be some little, little, little woman running behind a goat in the hills of Kenya, but it won't be made in America. Hmm. I just don't think we 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 have what we need. What will it look? And like? I'm not a pessimist. What will it look like, Walter? I think it's going to be somebody who first understands their connection with nature. And then body. Mm -hmm. That's first. We can pick up the rest, but a uh, person who is not in their body is a very dangerous leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a person who is afraid of the body, who fears the body, who injures the body, is a very dangerous leader. Mm -hmm. I used to work with African uh, shaman, Bobby, and uh, I used to be fascinated by how nasty they were. <laughs> you know, always in the dirt, playing with the ground. They knew stuff because they played with the dirt. Thoughts. All the Christians here speak up. <laughs> I really like that idea of coming together around issues, you know, that there are things that, like sexual violence or like LGBTQ issues that are affecting families and people and human beings and bodies in the world all around us. And I just wanted you to expand a little bit on sort of what you thought that those kinds of things might look like if you came together around I traveled this weekend to Chicago, mainly to see my sister, who is not well. But one of the things I'll do is have a meeting with uh, some churches on the west side of Chicago, North Lawndale. They are working with some other agencies within the city uh, to deal with the incredible gun violence and the massacre of young men and women on the west side of Chicago. Uh, on the west side, it would look like certainly having many of the young people in leadership roles or in spaces close to leadership. Mm -hmm. It would also mean that some of the folks who are already doing the hard work with gun violence probably need to be in more prominent roles than some of the pastors mm -hmm. who might not know. The pastors can deliver the people but the pastors may not really know what the significant issues are, the significant issues at stake. So uh, my concern nowadays is really with this level of, of not just gun violence itself, but the, act, the massacre of our young people. We're watching it, and it's like we're spectators. It's like we're out of our bodies watching it. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask ways in which we really get it. Jerry, Hazel. Yes, sir. Um, you. you talked about the importance of, of commitment, and I know I haven't talked about that, but I wanted to uh, hear a little bit more about uh, the importance of integrity and kind of the wholeness behind that. And as you were teaching us in, in the, the Thurman class about the importance of that, I'd like to hear what role the, uh, the church should play in that, and what, would, what advice would you give to uh, young leaders <coughs> coming up, uh, what, what, what should that look like? Yeah, before integrity is a moral concept, 
integrity has to do with, it's kind of like the congregating that I'm talking about. It has to do with the coming together of all of these disparate parts of our being. Uh, when I use the Thurman example, I talk about, Thurman says the guy named, uh, well, in the graveyard, who was having all of these problems. And when Jesus and the disciples showed up, uh, the disciples got some hair. They were gone. Jesus stood there and looked the guy in the eyes and said, uh, I only asked him one question. He said, who are you? And the guy said, you know, that's my whole problem. <laughs> if I could just, just get my name right, all of my other problems would be solved. He said, that's why they call me Legion, because there's so many of us when we riot in the streets. Integrity is about the coming together of those different parts of us, those memories which we've hidden from ourselves. I frankly believe that most leaders would really benefit from having a little time on the couch with somebody, with somebody. And, and just kind trying your best to bring those pieces together and offer some kind of balance or integrity or wholeness to this. So, so uh, perceiving the kind of moral uh, dimension of coming together, integrity is, is about the very act, the very act of being whole, which has a lot to do with identity. Hazel, I saw your hand and now it's gone. Now I see Robbins. Circling my question, maybe I should ask it just in case. Um, yeah, um, Dr. Walton spoke about the inebriated church, and I'm curious about that, particularly because I think um, what I thought of was like drinking the Kool Aid almost. Mm -hmm. Like you drink the Kool Aid, but I think the drinking the Kool Aid is a result of white supremacy and trying to just survive. And so I, I would love to hear from you. I haven't read your book yet. I'm sorry, don't, don't like throw me out of the fire. But um, <laughs> the grading time is coming. <laughs> <laughs> this book isn't even required for me. <laughs> um, sort of how black churches can move from a survival mode, which like the drink and the Kool-Aid seems like a survival tactic to sort of maintain in the society. What, um, sort of leadership practices or spiritual practices do the black church leaders or lay leaders, all leaders in the church, um, what can they embody to move from that survival um, mode to be I able to move from I think race plays a part as a kind of ideological trap that we fall <coughs> into, it plays a part. But there's another place where I think leaders especially must assume some form of responsibility for their actions. Okay. And as we've discussed, reaction. So drinking the Kool-Aid, if you're conscious that the Kool-Aid is killing people, and you're surviving somehow because you're a superman or superwoman, I think that's something that you need to deal with. And many of these leaders, uh, correct me, uh, Dr. Walton, if I'm wrong, many of these leaders really know they're drinking the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. But they enjoy. Uh, not so much the Mercedes, as he said, or the Bentley. It's these airplanes. And I said, I need an airplane to go around the corner. <laughs> but but it's, it's, it, that's drinking the Kool-Aid. And it happens uh, not just in mega churches. I think it begins even with folks who are pastoring storefront churches. Drinking the Kool-Aid is, is just part of what people do in America. Part of a market economy. We have called neoliberal. We love to rush to the Kool-Aid to the fountain and deal with sun. Robin. Robin? I was just going to say, uh, Dr. Fluker, you talked quite a bit about uh, the quote, one of the favorite quotes that I, that I enjoyed was when you referenced W.E.B. Du Bois, and it says, um, how does it feel to be a problem when you're referencing the black male? <clears throat> In this current climate of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, Colin Kaepernick, there's so many instances where you see that uh, so many tactics to try to suppress the voice of the black male. It's, it, it's obviously not happened at BU. But I'm just saying, what do you say in the, sta in the place of the church environment where so many people are falling into that trap? How do they come out of those cultural asylums that think that they can't navigate past that and still be successful under this current administration? 
Well, that's great, Robin. There's several questions in that. Uh, I'll answer one. The uh, the problem that we always try to uh, think through with the boys is always somehow related to double consciousness and the struggle uh, to be in this world or to be a citizen. You know, it plays out in different ways. Um, I would focus for the large part beyond the comments I've already made on a sense of integrity and commitment. I think we need to really deal with this national imaginary, mm -hmm. which is elusive. It keeps promising us that we're going to have citizenship rights, mm -hmm. <laughs> full citizenship. <coughs> and uh, it's not working. This is not working. And I, I name it as a radical egalitarian hypothesis because uh, it's, it's, it, the postulate is that everybody has access to this. But if you're from the island of Puerto Rico right now, you don't. And we've seen it uh, in too many vivid ways to pretend it's not true. So part of the work of feeling like a problem is the uh, problem of absolutely being dismissed by the very, very shrine uh, where you worship uh, this, this God of national might and power and impact. We need to repent from that in a hurry in churches. I don't, I don't see any, hardly any churches I go into that don't have the American flag, there, even if they got the black flag. And I'm not positing some new pan-Africanism. I'm just saying you might want to someday just really think about the symbol of this flag and its relationship to what you're calling good religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. The old slaves used to have a song they said, is you got good religion? Mm -hmm. Not all religion is good. Mm -hmm. one of is you got good religion? And I'm not sure waving a flag higher than you wave the cross is good religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're at 6.30. Um, I'm going to respond to that.